When I think of all my faults and my failures When I consider all the times I've let God down I am humbled by the grace He has Bibles and find Acts chapter 16 in your Bible this morning. Acts chapter 16. Sometimes when people bring guests with them to church, they ask if certain people could sing, and that was the case this morning. This one asked if Melody would sing. And so there you go. And now you know that I love you the most, and you're my favorite church member. Acts chapter 16. The choir sang that song a while ago. I know my name is there. Aren't you glad you know your name is there? I was thinking about it as they sing. There's people who will go through their entire earthly life in suspense and just hoping and, and working and trying to make sure they get to heaven, if there even is a heaven, when they die. But for those of us that are saved, we know, it's today we know that our name is written there. What a, what a great song that is. In, in 1 John chapter 5, I believe, it's verse, uh, I believe it's verse 13. Let me just go there. I want to make sure I read it right. Here's what, uh, here's what John says about knowing. And you, you, I hope you're thankful for your Bible, but here's, here's what it says in verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I'm glad I know this morning that I have eternal life, not because of who I am, not because of anything I've done, but all because of who he is and what he's done for me. I know I am saved this morning. Acts chapter 16, 
We're going to read a few verses together. If you know your Bible very well, then you know that the book of Acts records uh, the early days of the church. Uh, you know that uh, the book of Acts records the, the founding of the church, but then also records the conversion of a main, man named Saul. Uh, after he's saved, his name is changed to Paul. We know him as the Apostle Paul, and it records not just his conversion, but then it records all of his ministry. The Apostle Paul was sent by God to the Gentile world and began traveling from city to city and starting churches, preaching the gospel, and doing really the first recorded missionary work. And so this morning we pick up the story about Paul's travels. We are going to read, uh, we're going to read from verse 14 down through about verse 17 or 18. It says, And a certain woman named Lydia a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. You know, if I had to, if I had to pick one verse out of, out of these, this passage uh, that I would like to see take place, it would be that verse. It's my prayer that God moves upon the hearts of the people. That is, that is you that are listening. I hope that God moves upon your hearts in such a way that you don't just hear me speak, but that um, the Lord would open it and that you would attend to the things that are spoken. In other words, if you would look after and make part of you the things that we read and preach from the Bible. Look at verse 15. And when she was baptized... Her household uh, and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Verse 16, And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. This girl was a, was a demon-possessed, uh, there was a demon-possessed fortune teller. Uh, isn't it strange how serious a stance the Bible takes on things that we make so light of? Isn't it? Uh, I mean, you're going you're gonna to laugh at me and think I'm going off the deep end when I tell you this, but I, I got a problem with movies like Aladdin and Bewitched and things like I got a problem with that. Um, my, I've, been, I've been laughed at because my, my parents wouldn't let us watch the cartoon The Smurfs growing up. And that's funny to me now, but I, I've watched it. Do you know how much magic and hocus pocus is in that? It, it, we would just think so, so lightly of it. We don't even give it a second thought. We th see fortune tellers and card readers and all of these things. I, I'm, I'm telling you, uh, God, God views things differently than we do. He, he does. And we do well to try to view them in the same light that he views them in. Amen, Pastor Summers. There's the first message. Let's see what the second one's going to be. Verse 17. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. You know what's interesting to me? Is that it says this woman in verse 16 is... A woman of divination. She's possessed with a spirit. And then it comes to verse 17, and it says, The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying. Now, that's strange to me. No, it's not, not strange, but it's very particular to me because if you will look at demon possession throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, what you'll find is when the, uh, when the individual speaks, the Bible differentiates between the demon speaking or the devil speaking and the individual speaking. Remember when Jesus was casting out the, the demons out of the man, he says, who are you? And the demon said, the Bible says that the demon spoke and said, our name is Legion for we are many. Made it very clear that it was the, the spirit that was speaking, but not the case here. Not the case here. Here it's the young lady speaking. Here it's the damsel doing the speaking. The Bible says she followed them. Every day she followed them, everywhere they went, and she'd be, she was crying after them. And some have said that it's a sarcastic thing she's saying. Some saying she's making fun of them. I, I don't know that to be the case. What I do know to be the case is the truth of the statement that she cries. Look at what she says. These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. 
Verse 18 says, this she did many days and Paul, uh, but Paul being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. You start dealing with demon possession and spirits and people get real uneasy, especially in the day that we live in. They think that you're going to start speaking in tongues and uh, splashing incense and all those things. I believe that demonic possession is a very real thing. If you're going to be a Bible believer, you have to believe that. I believe that it's just as, just as visible today as it was back when the book of Acts was penned. I believe that we've become so accustomed to many of these things that we don't even think twice about them. I'm convinced of this. I'm going to tell you a lot of the things that we see in the movies and we see uh, and we listen to in the music, so many of those things, if you will think about what they're saying, think about what they're doing, you find them in Scripture and it's not in a positive light. All the way through your Bible, uh, music and, and beat and drums and those kinds of things, they're used all the way through Scripture and many times in temple worship, but many times also we find those things being used for uh, demon worship and devil worship and evil things. And I don't know all the details of this young lady's life. I don't know, I don't know what her, her name is in this passage. I don't, I don't understand all the, 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 the circumstances that surround here. But here's what I know. Somewhere along the line, this damsel got tangled up with some men who did not have her best interest in mind, who did not love her, they did not care for her. All they wanted from her was money. And because of her, uh, of the, the connection between her and these evil spirits, she was able to, to speak prophecy and, and, and tell the fortunes of people. And, and she was making her master's money and that's all they cared about. But one day, Paul entered the scene. And when he came in contact with this young lady, she didn't know anything else about Paul but these two things. Number one, these men are servants of the Most High God. And number two, they are showing us the way of salvation. Showing us the way of salvation. If I could only pick two things to be known of or known by in this world, those two things would be at the top of my list. If I, I don't care if, if I'm never known as a scholar, as a deep thinker, I don't care if I'm ever, uh, if I'm ever known of, as, as a wealthy businessman, none of those things matter as long as when people hear Adam Summers, they say he is a servant of God and he lives to tell others about the way of salvation. What a, what a great testimony this damsel speaks about the Apostle Paul and the men that, that were with him. What an amazing thing to be known by. Just in your mind, if, if you were to die today at your funeral, what would you be remembered by? When people speak your name, what will they think of? I don't know, and I'm not looking to pick a fight, but I'm guessing very few of us would have the testimony that he's a man of God and he was always showing the way of salvation. That ought to convict us. Because we've been bought with a price. We are not our own. We're to glorify God in our body, in our members, the, body say, or the Bible says. We ought to make that the focus of our lives. We ought to be known by that. This damsel says that they are there showing the way of salvation. That is the job of every missionary that we send. The missionaries leave the United States, the ones that go overseas, leave their homeland, go to a strange land for the sole purpose of showing the way of salvation. They don't go there to live a life of luxury. They don't go there to live on one big long vacation. They go there simply to show others the way of salvation. Now, you're here this morning and I, I, don't, I, I don't know all, that's, all the people that are here, but I'm guessing everyone here is more than likely an American citizen. And because you're an American citizen, I know for sure without any doubt, you have been blessed with privilege and opportunity that many people have not. 
Now, there may be others around you who have more than you, have been offered more than you, but the reality is simply as an American, you've been exposed to and blessed with more than many people around this world. I was talking with, I was talking with Brother Taylor one day. Brother Taylor was working on a, on a medical center overseas. I forget the name of the country that you're in, but he was talking about how little they had. How compared to us, they just have so little. We don't know much about that. We are, we are a blessed people. Spiritually speaking, we are far more blessed than most people. I said, take your Bibles out this morning, and the vast majority of us grabbed a Bible that we call our own. That is a blessing that many people do not have. See, we understand the way of salvation. It's been taught to us. We've been given it. But many people don't. I'd like to talk to you this morning for a few minutes about that way of salvation. The way of salvation. This young lady's life is about to be changed completely. Look at verse 19. It says, And when her masters uh, saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas, threw them into the market, and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. So this damsel is making their master, her masters a lot of money. Paul enters the scene, shows the way of salvation. The masters see all hope of their gains is gone. And look at the complaint. The complaint is that these men trouble us. They teach things that are not our customs. That's a, that's a strange thing for them to accuse them of. This damsel says they're teaching the way of salvation. And I just tell you the way of salvation has not changed since the book of Acts. The way of salvation is a great blessing to those who have been down that way, but it troubles those who have not. Though the way of salvation is the same in that those who are saved understand what the way of salvation truly is. We're thankful for it. We rejoice in it. We're content that God has saved us. But those who have not been down the way of salvation, they on the outside looking at us don't understand the joy that we have. They don't understand why we would come together on a beautiful day like it's outside right now. They don't know why we would come together on a Sunday morning and on a Sunday night and then again on Wednesday. They don't get it. But those of us that are saved... The body of Christ means everything to us. For those of us that are saved, the word of God means everything to us. Those of us that are saved, the peace that passes all understanding, it means everything to us. The way of salvation, four or five things very quickly about this way. Find John chapter three with me in your Bibles. John chapter three. First thing we see about this way is that it's a very personal way. It's a very personal way. Uh, in, the, in the New Testament, you find different groups of people. You find the, uh, the Pharisees, which were the religious leaders of the day. They had been in, in power, if that's what you want to call it, for about 200 years. And, and they had been uh, the, the interpreters and teachers of the law. You have the Sadducees, who were more of lawyers. And, and uh, they had uh, studied it more of an academic standpoint of the law. You have, have the scribes, which were in charge of the duplication and the, and the record keeping of all the, the happenings of the Jews. And in this, particular, in this particular passage in John chapter 3, we find a man from the group of the Pharisees. Those religious leaders who were telling people how they ought to live and holding themselves very high. But this man comes to Jesus. Look what it says in verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. This is John chapter 3. A ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This statement Jesus makes to Nicodemus is a very troubling statement for Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a part of the largest, or the largest religious group in Jerusalem. He is not just a part of that group. The Bible says he was a ruler in that group. He had studied the Bible. He, he knew the word of God. He, he, he had the Old Testament scriptures. He knew all about that and he thought that he was somebody. And he came to Jesus one night, snuck up to him and said, Jesus, we, we know know that you're a teacher come from God. And Jesus says, and it blows Nicodemus away. Jesus says, 
No man can come, no man will see the kingdom of God unless he's first born again. Now here's a man, uh, here's a man that is a part of a church that everybody wants to be a part of. Brother Glenn, let's turn this off. I'll just use this microphone. Thank you, sir. He's a part of a church that, no, that everybody wants to be a part of. He is the, the, the upper level religious guy. And Jesus looks at him and says, that's not good enough. It does not matter what church you go to. It doesn't matter which religious group you're a part of. If you're not born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. So friend, the first stop along this way of salvation is that very personal stop. You need to understand that you, while I'm glad you're here this morning and I'm, I'm glad you sing the songs with us and I'm glad that we'll fellowship in a little bit, I'm glad for all of that. If you've never been born again, you are not saved, period. There are people that are resting so securely, they think, in their church membership. What a shame. They'll stand before God one day and they'll say, I was a member of Faith Baptist Church. I went there often. I put money in the offering plate. And there's going to stand God, having given his only begotten son to be killed for that person. And he's going to say, what is that to me? Well, I'm glad you had a good church to go to, but it's too bad you never trusted in my son, Jesus. We act like sometimes with God's going to be impressed but all by what all we've done for him. And we forget about what Jesus Christ did for us. This way of salvation is a very personal way. You must be born again. You can't be born again for your children. I can't be born again for you. But you must be born again. It's a very personal thing. Secondly, how about a convicting way? It's a personal way and it's also a convicting way. Look at chapter 8 of John. Just flip a couple of pages over in your Bible. John chapter 8. One of the reasons that, one of the, the most common reasons, I believe, that people are not, are not saved is because the conviction that precedes salvation can be such an embarrassing thing for people. You're, you, won't, you won't find yourself in a more embarrassing situation than the woman that we're about to read about. Look at this portion of Scripture with me. John chapter 8, look at verse 3. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Did you understand what just took place here? Here's a woman who is caught in the act of adultery. She's taken from a place of that sin and taken immediately, she's drugged to the feet of Jesus. She's thrown down in the middle of this crowd. Jesus is in the middle of preaching. Can you imagine this? Jesus is, is, is in the middle of a discourse and this crowd of people. And then a commotion begins to break out. And in the midst of all of that, this woman is cast at Jesus' feet. And the Pharisees say, Jesus, this woman was taken in adultery. We caught her in the very act. What do you think we ought to do with her? If you or I were put in that position, I think that most of us would understand what humility and humiliation really is. I think we know what embarrassment is. Can I say the embarrassment and the humiliation that this woman suffered is the same, is the same convicting humiliation that every single Christian has had to experience? Do you realize, look, look down here at um, verse 10. Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Do you understand? Had she never been caught in her sin, 
she would have never heard the words Jesus spoke when he said, neither do I condemn thee. Had she never been caught, had the sin been concealed and never been brought to light, the situation would have never been resolved. She'd have gone on in her sin and she'd have never known what it's like to be forgiven by Jesus Christ. Thank God for the day I was convicted of my sin. I'm so thankful for the day where my mom and my dad made sure that I understood that I was a sinner. As good as I thought I was, I was still a sinner. And while I might fool all of you and I might fool my mom and dad and all of my family, I would never fool God. It was as though I had been caught in the very act and thrown at Jesus' feet and said, here's this man, here's a sinner, we know what he is, we caught him in the act, now what are we going to do with him? I remember that hey, I, was, I was seven years old and I remember very clearly that feeling of humiliation and conviction in the presence of my holy and righteous God as I realized my sin. The way of salvation is a personal way. It's also a convicting way. Think of King David. Remember King David had an affair with a woman named Bathsheba. Thought he had gotten away with it. He had Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, killed in battle. And thought he had gotten away and concealed the whole matter. Till one day, a prophet named Nathan shows up. Says, David, I'm going to tell you a neat little story. I told a story about a man, a wealthy man, who stole his poor neighbors. The neighbor was poor, living in poverty, had one lamb stole that lamb from the neighbor instead of taking one of his own. It was a parable. And David heard it and got mad and said, you tell me who did this, I'll go take care of it. Remember those fateful words? Nathan the prophet says, thou art the man. Had David never heard the words, thou art the man, the sin would have been concealed and no one else would have had the boldness, no one else would have had the nerve to call out the king on something he had done. In the next few verses, King David begs God to forgive him, which God does. I'm simply saying, without the conviction, there is no forgiveness. There must be conviction. It's a convicting way. Sadly, a lot of people never make it past that part of the way. They never make it past it. Not only is it a personal way and a convicting way, it's also a narrow way. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Here's what Jesus says about the way. He says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Matthew 7, verse 14, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. It's a personal way, and it's a convicting way, it's also a narrow way. If you just go the way of the crowd, you'll miss the way of salvation. If you just be a follower and go the way everybody else is going, you're going to miss the way of salvation. It's happening all the time. There are churches that are, that are massive. They're huge churches and lots of people are going. And I'm not saying that any one church is, is, is uh, full of lost people simply because it's a large church. But I get real nervous when the entire, when a mob of people are all in agreement about something. You better look at it really, really close. The vast majority of the time, the, 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 the Bible shows that the, the mob is usually wrong. The vast majority of the time, I'll go all the way back to Exodus and you begin to see, even back then, the majority is seldom right. There's always a few faithful, a few that will seek the truth, a few that will be willing to break ranks and, and go the right way while everybody else is going the wrong way. There's always a few. I want to be part of that few. See, the, the way is, is narrow. You won't be, you, you may find yourself walking alone on this way. You may feel like no one else is going. You may feel like it's, no one else cares. No one else wants to be around you. But I'm telling you, the way of salvation is a narrow way. A narrow way. But those who take that way find life everlasting. 
The ones who take that narrow way are the ones the choir sang about a while ago. I know my name is there. Who cares if it's on a, if your name is in a, on a roll of some big, huge church if you're not saved? Who cares what associations you have if you don't know the Lord as your Savior? It doesn't matter. Get on the narrow way. It's the right way. It's also a blood-stained way. Find the book of Hebrews with me, please. The book of Hebrews. It's a blood-stained way. We used to have a track that was in our track rack, and it was uh, the front of it was uh, a drawing someone had made of Jesus Christ on the cross, and there was blood coming down off his face from the crown of thorns. There was blood streaming out of his hands. There was a hole in his side with blood coming down, and uh, the his feet had blood coming out of the the, the wound from the nails. And the picture showed all of that and then showed the blood pooling up on the ground around the cross. And it was a very striking picture. It would, it would get your attention, which I suppose was the intended result. But I was handing those out one time in, uh, in Indiana and um, went to hand it to somebody one time. And they, they went to grab it and they drew back and went, ugh. They said, why is it so bloody? And the thought occurred to me, if they knew what that blood did for them, they'd thank God that it was bloody. They, they would. The way of salvation, while it is a personal way, it's a convicting way. The way of salvation is a narrow way, but the way of salvation is also a blood-stained way. If, you, if the way you're on, the, the, the salvation you're pursuing, if it's on any way that doesn't, isn't soaked in blood, then you're on the wrong way. The way of salvation, the way of true salvation is stained with our Savior's blood. Look in, in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without, the, without shedding of blood is no remission. Do you understand that the shedding of our Savior's blood was not just, well, it was not just some sideshow. It was the main attraction. Our Savior's blood paid for our sin. Without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. Look at chapter 10. Look at chapter 10, beginning reading with me in verse, uh, verse 18. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin, <clears throat> having therefore... Brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience and, and, and our bodies washed with pure water. Do you understand the purging and the cleansing that took place when you got saved? Jesus Christ died on Calvary and shed his blood and in doing so washed you and sprinkled you from your sins. I say praise his name. If someone tries to give you any gospel message besides the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you throw that away. You throw it away. The way of salvation, the way of salvation that Paul preached, the way of salvation that Peter preached, the way of salvation that Jesus preached, that way is a blood-stained way. Find John chapter 14 with me, please. John chapter 14. The way of salvation... It's an exclusive way. An exclusive way. Uh, somebody sent me a video several years ago of, of the Oprah Winfrey show. Don't look at me like you don't know what that is. Come on. Many of you, if, is she even still on TV? Is she still on? No. Many of you are watching reruns. You've recorded it over the years and you... Right? No, I don't know. Someone sent me a video one time of Oprah. And she had um, some, <laughs> some religious guy on there. And uh, she had this, this panel of people. He was in the middle, and there's some other people that believe like him sitting on either side of him. And um, 
they were talking about religion and the inclusiveness of religion and how God can be whatever you want him to be and it could very well be different for every person. And then they had a microphone set up in the audience and there was, best I remember, there was two aisles and they had a microphone in each aisle and a, and a lady, a very modest looking lady, got up to the microphone and said, the Bible says that there is no other way but through Jesus Christ. And so how can God be whatever I want him to be if the God that I choose says that your God can't be? And I remember Oprah saying, there can't just be one way. There, there can't just be one way. And to my surprise, there was other people in the audience that started taking the side of this lady who had pointed out that Jesus said he's the only way. And Oprah was just, just flabbergasted that someone would dare say there's no other way. But I'm here to tell you there is no other way. The way of salvation is exclusive. You may, you may find salvation from your conscience some other way. You may find salvation from the condemnation of your family or friends in some other way. You may find salvation from well, something besides your sins some other way. But when it comes to salvation from sin, there is one way. It's a personal way and it's a convicting way. It's a narrow way. It's a blood-stained way and it is the only way. Jesus Christ, look what he says here in John chapter 14. Look what Jesus Christ says. Now, if this is too deep for you, you need some help with it, send me afterwards and I'll go over it slow with you. Here's what he says in verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, that's not real deep. Jesus says, I am the way. When he said, I am the way, what he meant was, he is the way, the only way, the only sure way, the only true way to our God. It's through Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know what way you're on this morning, but here's what I know without any doubt. In Acts chapter 16, there's a damsel who was demon-possessed, and, and, and the, she found the way of salvation because a preacher preached the way of salvation to her. She believed it. She was baptized. She was saved from her sin. I've delivered the same message to you this morning. The message is very simple. You're a sinner in need of a Savior. You cannot save yourself. If you're here this morning and you've never been saved, you've never been born again as John 3 stated, then today is the day of salvation for you. What will you do with it? What will you do with it? Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. He shed his blood for you. He paid for your sins. And what are you doing with it? What way are you on? Would you stand with me, please, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed? I've tried my best to show you the way of salvation this morning. All that's left is for you to accept and believe what Jesus Christ has done for you. The book of Romans tells us that with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That means you can believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, died on the cross for your sins. But it takes the prayer of a repenting sinner asking God to save them. It takes that for you to be saved. Wouldn't you like to be saved this morning? How about letting me pray for you? Would you let me do that? If you'd say, Pastor Summers, I'm not sure that I'm saved, but please pray for me. Can I see your hand very quickly? Just put it up, put it right back down. There's no one looking around. It's just me. Can I see your hand? Anyone at all who say, please pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm saved. Thank you, sir. I see that hand. Anyone else? Just pray for me, preacher. I, I don't know for sure that I'm on the way of salvation. Perhaps you're here this morning, and there's a need in your family or maybe in your personal life that I don't know or maybe I wouldn't even understand. Would you let me pray for you? Would you raise your hands? Let me see them. Thank you. Hands all over the place. Thank you. In the back, I see those hands. God bless you. Thank you, sir. I see that hand in the back. Sure, I'm thankful that I can stand before a group of people and tell them that while I may not understand completely their needs, my Savior does and can meet those needs. Whatever your need is this morning, we're going to have an invitation in just a moment. And I'll invite you to come to the altar and if you'd like to pray and seek the Lord's help on whatever it might be, I invite you to come. If you'd like to come and be saved this morning, 
That would be great. That would be great. You could leave this place a child of God, knowing for sure that you're saved, knowing for sure that you're on the way of salvation. You could be saved today. Lord, I thank you for your word. God, thank you for showing us the way of salvation. Lord, you've seen the hands that have been raised. While there was just one hand raised, admitting that they were lost, Lord, I'm sure in a crowd this size there must be more. God, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would move on the hearts of those individuals. Lord, please convict them of sin. Please make sin seem so sinful and wicked in their eyes. And then, God, I pray that you give them boldness to move and to seek help and get saved before it's eternally too late. And then, God, for these other hands that were raised, you know the needs they represent. God, I ask you to please intervene and show yourself to be mighty on their behalf. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Dick, what page are we going to?